Great, thanks. Um, Anshuman, I'm a final year PhD candidate at University of Virginia, and today I'll be talking about, as Florian mentioned, uh, pitfalls when you're trying to evaluate adversarial attacks in the black box setting specifically. And although we had some brief mention of adversarial examples, I'll just try and set it up briefly. Let's say you have this sort of a classic ML pipeline where you have this image or input X, and this passes to a target model, and then it gives you some sort of a prediction from the model. Let's say, call it FX, and in the case of multi-class classification, it could be a vector of probabilities, and let's say the actual class for the input image corresponds to C of x. When we say we want an adversarial input, what we really mean is that if we can add some sort of noise to the input such that the model's prediction changes. There can be two goals when you're trying to do this. The first one could be untargeted, where you really just care about changing the model's prediction from what it currently is, and then targeted where you want the model to predict a specific class for the given input. And because this could be trivially solved by just changing the image itself, we want some sort of imperceptibility in the noise that we add, which is usually enforced with some sort of LP norm on the noise that we add. And when I mention black box setting, what I really mean is that when you're trying to attack the target model, all you get is API access where you give your inputs to the model and you get in return some sort of feedback from the model. And when we're looking at black box adversarial attacks, there's really two broad approaches that you could take. The first one is based on transfer attacks where you have access to some sort of local models. And based on some sort of an iterative subroutine, you can generate adversarial inputs with the examples that you have access to. And in the query-based setting, you can try to utilize interactive access that you have to the target model and try to refine your perturbations based on the kind of feedback you're getting. Now what we did is we looked at all the black box adversarial attacks in the literature for image classification models specifically, and based on our meta-analysis of about 164 different attacks published since 2014, we tried to propose some sort of a taxonomy uh, for the threat model. And the reason we do this is even though they're all working in the black box setting, there are implicit assumptions on the threat model that can introduce some sort of biases or differences in how one attack is compared to the other. So the very first access we propose is based on query access. And what this really means is, do you really have interactive access to the target model, or is it the case that you generate your perturbation and just package it, send it to the model, and hope that it works out? Or do you have interactive access so you can get some sort of feedback and refine your perturbations based on whatever you get back? The second is, if you do get feedback, what kind of granularity do you get the feedback for? Is it just the actual label that the model predicted? Is it the full score of probabilities? Or is it some top k prediction probabilities? The final, the third one relates to the kind of auxiliary data you have and the quality of auxiliary data. And what we really mean by quality is how similar is this to the kind of data that the target model was using in training its model. So no overlap really means that there is completely no data overlap. This could be true for something like a malware classifier like virus total API. Partial overlap really means that there's some sort of overlap in the feature or label space. So maybe the target model was using ImageNet for its models, and then you have access to something like C400 or tiny ImageNet. And for complete overlap, you're using the exact same data set that the target model was using to train its model. And finally, the data quantity. So even if you have this kind of data, how much data do you really have? Is it sufficient to train performant auxiliary models, or can you really only compute some statistics with the kind of data you have. And finally, there's also this concept of pre-trained model access, which we really call a sub-access. And the reason is that, at least in the vision domain, this is more of an artifact based on the kind of advancements we have. And if you're really trying to fool a target model that's been trained on ImageNet, there is a ton of models available on the internet which were also trained on ImageNet, which can be used as good starting points for adversaries. But this may not be true for more real-world situations like malware classifiers which is why any sort of attacks that use pre-trained models, we club them in the category that has no sufficient data but does have high overlap or any kind of overlap depending on the pre-trained model. And based on these four axes and the taxonomy that it induces, we try to categorize existing attacks. And what we see is that almost all of them fall in these big major categories, but the important point over here is that there are these gaping holes in the taxonomy. And Unfortunately, the kind of areas where there's been no work with respect to the specific threat models happen to be the ones that would be probably most relevant in practice. For instance, as an adversary, if you don't have access to data that overlaps significantly with the target model, but you, if you have access to lots of data, it's kind of like having access to the internet. For instance, if you're trying to fool GPT-4 or something like that, you don't know the exact data set they use, but you can get a lot of data from the internet. <coughs> 
Similarly, in the setting where you get some sort of feedback, but it's not all prediction probabilities, just the top K ones, if you look at real world APIs like Clarify or other image-based tagging systems, they do return top K probabilities, but in the literature right now, there's exactly one attack that tries to utilize this extra information as opposed to the hard label setting. And based on this analysis, we also try to draw insights as to what we could do or what future directions uh, the research community could take. The first one is that the kind of areas that I just described, for instance, the top case setting, someone could trivially argue that any attack that works in the hard label setting by extension should work in the top case setting. But of course, if you have access to this additional information, you should be able to do something better, which is exactly what we propose in a simple experiment where we take the existing state of the art, which is the attack in green over here for the top case setting NES. And what we then do is we take another attack, which is supposed to use all prediction probabilities, which is the square attack. And then we try to modify it very simply such that it can work in the top case setting. And what we see is that this very simple modification beats the existing state of the art, at least in the low query setting. But if you compare this for the high query setting with another attack that doesn't use the probabilities at all, like the sign flip attack, it's still not any better. So there definitely is this potential for improving attacks that utilize the top key prediction probabilities. Similarly, when you're comparing one attack with the other, in the literature, it's common to pick whatever attacks are in that specific threat model on a very broad level. For instance, if you're looking at transfer attacks, you'll blindly compare with other transfer attacks. But the thing is, one transfer attack may be using some sort of auxiliary information that others do not. So in that sense, it's an apple to oranges comparison. For instance, if you look at the ODS RGF attack, which is supposed to be a query-based attack, in the original paper, they compared it with the square attack. But the thing is, ODS RGF uses auxiliary models, whereas the square attack does not. So something like the square attack could potentially be used for malware classifiers, but ODS would require auxiliary models. And based on a very simple modification of the square attack, we are able to outperform the current state of the art with a query efficiency that's 10 times as better. And finally, my personal favorite is baseline comparison, specifically for transfer attacks. The current norm right now when you're proposing black box transfer attacks is if you have a new attack, you compare it with previous ones and try to evaluate them both for the same number of iterations because these attacks do have some sort of an iterative nature with the subroutines. But A, all of them have used this magic number 40, so they all run their attacks for 40 iterations, which is something we try to challenge because it may have been uh, something that could be justified by the very initial attack, but there's really no reason to run for just 40 iterations. And what we see is that if you run it for even 50, 60 more iterations, your attack success rate can go from less than 30%, which is the state of the art currently for this situation, to more than 60%, so it more than doubles. And the second sort of insight we draw is, as an adversary, I don't really care if attack A can perform better than attack B for the same number of iterations. What I care about is, given the kind of budget and time constraints I have, what's the best attack success rate I could get. So what we do propose is instead of comparing attacks based on these metrics like iterations, have something that aligns better with what the adversaries would care about, like the total runtime of the attack. And what we see is that by simply running the attack for 10 more minutes, you can get almost triple attack success rate with existing attacks and implementations with no modifications. But there is one caveat over here is that in some attacks like the one in yellow, SMI, MI, FGSM, it doesn't really matter when you stop the attack as long as you're running it for a sufficiently long amount of time, but you would ideally want to know the optimal stopping point. And currently, if you try to use local loss or the local attack success rate, that doesn't really correlate with the kind of best performance you would get, so there definitely is scope for research in this particular aspect, trying to figure out what the optimal stopping point would be. And finally, attacks in the literature, not only did they compare attacks with the same number of iterations, they also seem to focus on these very simple, in some sense, settings, such as untargeted attacks with sufficiently high perturbation norms. And we also encourage researchers to consider difficult and harder settings, like targeted attacks, attacks with low perturbation norms, and attacks against adversarially robust models. Finally, as, as, a, as an overview takeaway, there are several threat models, even in the black box setting, that are underexplored and happen to align well with what practical adversaries would care about. So we call researchers to maybe think about these particular settings. And even when we're comparing one attack with the other, even if they're both under the black box setting, do remember that there could be subtle differences in the threat model. And finally, if you're comparing attacks and proposing one over the other or 
advocating for attack A being better than B, you should really think about what the adversary cares about, which is just the attack success rate within a given budget. And our entire code base is public with about 50 or 60 attack implementations if you want to use it, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions now.